Hey guys, welcome to the Friday 10X Automotive. My name is Steve Spray, and today we are gonna be talking about the 10 reasons closers fail. So guys, welcome. Hey, so every single Friday we come to you guys live right here to talk about how to get your sales game right. So if you guys are here and you're in sales, you're a manager, if you're a, a general manager, if you're somebody who actually runs a dealership, if you're somebody who wants to get into sales, this, this show is actually gonna be particularly for you. So. Uh, we're excited to have you here and thank you so much. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a concept uh, that Grant Cardone lays out uh, not only in one of his best-selling books, The Closer Survival Guide, he actually built a program around this topic inside Cardone On Demand, which is the world's number one automotive sales training program. So uh, we're going to do a deep dive on it today, dive deep into this topic to make sure that you understand it. And uh, I remember the first time I looked at it, I remember the first time I, I actually got into this information. I read the Closer Survival Guide. I was a new salesperson. I was a sales, actually no, I was not new. I was new to the, the company that I worked with, but I had been in sales for four or five years at this time in my life. And I remember, you know, just looking at this list. I'm looking at the 10 reasons closers fail. And I like, I was mind blown because I was like, check mark, check mark, and, I'm, and I literally, I had more check marks on there than ones that I didn't have. And so then I, I started asking myself, I'm like, hey, no wonder you're not getting the results you want. So what we're gonna look at today, guys, is, uh, is something that you can definitely find in a program. It's called the, the Closer Survival Guide and uh, inside Cardone On Demand. We're gonna dive into that, so uh, welcome. If you guys wanna dial in, we'd love to take your call. If you guys got deals that you run into with problems, you guys got deals that you were trying to negotiate, you know, you got somebody who walked into your store and, uh, you know, they had problems with, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you're running an advertisement and they had an objection to it. You know, I'm talking about ad cars, best price objections. I'm talking about negative equity deals. Uh, call us, drop it in, man. I, I want to literally walk you through this. I used to have problems with those too until I found out, look, there's a way to handle these things. There's a way to get better and actually know uh, what you're doing in a deal. You know, the reality of the situation is, the customer wants to be in a better position. You've got a product that could put them in a better position. What ends up happening is the communication in the sales cycle typically does not go the right way. And so both parties feel like they're not getting the deal done. This all just comes down to actual understanding of what you're doing and how to get a deal done. The best closers in the entire world understand the customer and how to get deals done. Okay, They are not the people who you know, know how to throw down. They're not the people who, you know, they got the biggest, boldest, they got, you know, all these, uh, you know, the slammers, you know, that, that's not really the deal, man. The best closer is somebody who knows how to navigate these tough waters of objections, problems, challenges, and can actually get the deal done. Now, Grant Cardone has laid out a process where he says, hey, look, here's how you would get the perfect deal done. And then also, if you run into objections or challenges or problems, look, there's ways to really navigate that. The right words can help you get the ball over the, the hump that you're running into and actually get it into the end zone for a deal. So let's actually look at a list right here. Uh, and if you guys do wanna call in, dial in at 305-865-8668. That's the number, I'm gonna be taking your calls. If you got any topic you wanna chat about, you drop in, you throw it into me, I'm gonna handle it for you. Uh, so let's take a look. Let's go into, uh, there's a program right here inside Cardone University in, uh, in Cardone On Demand, uh, specifically talking about the 10 reasons closers fail. And um, we'll show this in a moment, guys. So what'll end up happening, guys, when you log in, so like if you're already on Cardone University, if you've already tapped into this, if you're one of our clients, we're just gonna, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, I'm gonna pull this one up. So what'll end up happening, guys, if you already have this program, the Cardone On Demand, the Cardone University, if you guys are familiar with this system, the training program, if you've used products like the Closer Survival Guide, there's a, a fair amount of data in there. It's really where it, it, it gets laid out. Uh, there's a deep dive in this program. And uh, let me get it here. When we get logged into this part right here, you, you gotta really understand these concepts. So uh, this is where, look, if you're having these problems in closing deals, just go back, just look at like, hey, do I even have some of these issues that are going on, right? So check this out. Uh, there's 10 different things that Grant's gonna lay out right here. Never attempted to close. Pressure perceived as a bad thing. Okay, let, let's just start tapping into some of these. Okay, number one, never attempted to close. Look, most people do not live by the concept that Grant talks about where there's a 100% write-up. 
You know, they get stuck on, well, we're not buying today. You know, they get stuck on, you know, we just came to look. You know, they get stuck on these things. Dude, a guy drove all the way across town, he was, just came to look, are you kidding me? Make it work for him. You know you can make it work for him. You know, the customer is uh, pausing. Salespeople get deals done. Salespeople are the ones who, who make the deal end up working. This is not revolving around price, by the way. This is something that, look, put them into a better situation, get them excited. Look, they were willing to spend their time to drive over to your place to basically say, you know what? Dude, I'm interested in getting out of what I have. And then the salespeople fall apart because they don't write the customer up 100%. They don't put them in the vehicle. They don't drive and they never ask this. Hey, do you, does this look like it works for you? Does this solve the problems that you have? Hey, what do you like best about this compared to what you have now? Look, these are trial closing questions that you can really ask to continue to move the deal further. When you're sitting down, you're negotiating a deal. You know, just giving them numbers and then letting them decide whether they want to do a deal or not is not how you get deals done. You got to have an arsenal of closes, which is actually one of the, the, uh, the topics. You got to be able to have things to say because they're going to drop things in like, well, you know, we got to talk to the spouse. You know, if you don't know what to say in that situation, how are you going to navigate it? You know, how are you, like these people make decisions all the time without the spouse. There's like some sort of uncertainty that are there. The spouse would probably be like, hey, look, get it. You're driving it. You're the one that's going to be using it. You're the one who's going to be doing this. Look if, look, if this is what you want, I'm all in. I'm all on board. Are you happy? If you like it, let's do it. Let's roll. Okay, this is the way, this is the way me and my fiance work. This, if she wants it, it, I love it. You know, I don't even have to see it. I, if you love it, I love it. Let's roll, you know? So guess what? They probably already talked about it before they got there. Uh, there's a statistic for you. The customer is 67% of the way through the buying process before they even get to your store. Okay, so what does that mean? That means they've been shopping online. That means they've been looking at products online. They've been looking at different pieces of inventory. Uh, this does not mean that when they come in, they are on the right product, right? So this is where you gotta start offering options. You guys got to start delivering proposals. I, I remember the first time I seen this was uh, when I was a younger salesperson and there was this older guy I was working with. This guy was, his name was Earl. He was Earl. Like this guy, he was just, like, you know, he wasn't even that well put together. So I, I, I was always like, and, and I was a young, sharp guy and I'm like, you know, I'm, do, I'm doing all the right things. Like I had a good attitude. I looked sharp. I dressed well. Uh, I knew the product. And this guy crushed me in sales every single month. And I'm like, man, he doesn't dress well. He's like, you know, I, I wasn't feeling his vibe. I'm like, how do other people feel this guy's vibe? And I noticed something about this guy. He wrote every single person up 100%. This guy lived by that policy. You know, so when I heard Grant Cardo, I think he got these ideas from Grant. The guy had been in sales for a long time. He studied sales training. And I start reading Grant Cardone's training. And Grant's like, dude, 100% write up policy. Uh, you give everybody numbers, you ask every person to buy. If you don't ask them to buy, you don't ever get an opportunity, right? And so most people simply miss sales because they're not asking. Because it doesn't even open the doors to anything else, okay? If you've got those challenges and you want to call in, if you ran into a situation where you're like, dude, I could have asked the deal, I didn't, what would you have done, how would you have said it, call in at 305-865-8668. Let's go back to our list right here. Let's take a look at these, you know, pressure. Number two, pressure is perceived as a bad thing. Grant Cardone talks a lot about internal objections. You know, this is something where he, he says, look, a lot of the objections that you get are, are probably things that you would agree with, you know? This is where people will get uh, objections that, look, they're probably given themselves, you know? Think about the last objection you got, okay? We gotta think about it. Are you personally thinking about things? Are you pausing to make decisions and actually stopping and saying, you know what? I like it, but I'm going to think about it. Look, because you create what ends up happening at the end of the deal. Like they went through your sales process and they ended up at the end of your sales cycle. So whatever you're getting in your deal is something you created. So you can either handle it earlier or you're going to deal with it at the end of the day. So let's go back to that. Pressure perceived as a bad thing. If you feel like you don't want to pressure somebody, then look, there's something you don't know about your product. There's something that you don't know about it being a better deal for the customer. And this is where, me personally, I think this is an internal objection. This is something that uh, if you knew it was the right thing, you would lean in. 
Once I started to get this, I started actually uh, making more follow-up contacts. I started actually telling people, hey, you should be doing this right now. You know, because I actually believe that. I believe because somebody once uh, put some pressure on me and actually confronted me about what I was doing and what I should have been doing, and I agreed with them. I was like, dude, you're, you're right. I need to do this right now. It changed things for me. Okay, so if you have pressure, if you're running into problems where like you feel like, you know what, I don't want to pressure people. It's a problem that you have, not a problem that they have. These people buy everything. They're going to spend money somewhere, but they're currently not spending it with you. So if you guys, if you guys want to drop in, I, I just seen they dropped the number right there. I guess it's on this side. That's awesome. Uh, the other thing would be, and probably the one reason why you don't want to add pressure to the deal is because you're unwilling to deal with emotions. Look, you may feel like the customer, let's just say they're like, you know what? Look, man, you're not giving me enough money for my trade. You guys are two grand apart. I don't want to do this unless I get all the money for the deal. And then you back off because you're unwilling to, to lean in on this guy and say, hey, look, man, even at a $2,000 loss, you know this is the right thing to do. And if you're unwilling to add that type of pressure, it's probably because you're unwilling to deal with the emotion that may come along with that. You know, you should expect that, look, things may get emotional in the close. This is where Grant has really broken down in his trainings how to be emotional, uh, get them emotional about the product. This is where you like dive into like, why now? Why did it? That, that's in the sales process. In the close, we should be very logical about this. You know, this is where we get down to... Uh, I need to be like a spot closer. I need to have, I don't need to have a ton of emotion. Like if they get emotional, I don't need to get emotional. Look, it makes sense to do it. It would make sense to do it now. There's literally never been a better time to do it right now. You're gonna spend the extra money somewhere. You're gonna do something with that. Why not put it in something where you spend a lot of your time every single day? You know, and this is where if you're unwilling to deal with somebody uh, who isn't willing to really, they're, you know, they're, they're kind of like, you know, maybe they're frustrated because they got a bad deal on their last vehicle and now that's like what's causing them to not move forward in this deal and, and you're having trouble not being able to say, you know, look man, cut your loss. Cut your loss on what you already made a bad decision on. Make the right decision on moving forward. That way you can continue to live your life in happiness rather than, you know, being stuck on something that was a mistake. Okay, and, and, and let me fix that for you. You being in the right vehicle is going to make all that problem go away. You know, this is where if you're unwilling to deal with the emotion that they may have, which typically isn't even that bad, by the way. I've seen, uh, I've seen general managers of stores freak out more than, than customers at a car dealership. So, you know, you dealing with Mrs. Jones at the desk, working a deal, and she's not feeling good about the price, look, you know, it's not a big deal. We got one? No? Yeah, okay. All right. So we've got a, a couple other ones, guys, that we want to dive into. Uh, what I, I, and this was a big one for me. Show, show this list again here because I just want to tap into these. We've actually talked about never attempted to close, pressure perceived as a bad thing, unwillingness to deal with emotion, and then also number four, a lack of belief in the product. This is something that if you do not buy your own product, you will have a hard time selling your product. I am telling you this from personal experience. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I used to work at a Honda dealership. And at that time in my life, okay, I was currently driving uh, an Infiniti. Okay? I thought this thing was bad to the bone, by the way. Okay? It was an uh, Infiniti G35, if you guys remember those. You guys remember those? Oh yeah, yeah, see I got the, yeah, exactly, man. You know, I, I thought it was cool, man. This was a cool car to me. I was fired up about it. But I went to go work at a Honda store. And regardless of me being fired up about something that I wanted, I was making the biggest mistake ever, ever. This was the worst thing. I learned the hard way on this. Do not do this to yourself, okay? I should have dropped that Infinity in two seconds and I should have got a Honda the second I got there because the problem I had, when I would talk to customers, you know, when they were coming in and, they, I, and I was making all this myself, I had people calling up and they're like, yeah, you know, we're interested. Hey, we wanna see that new Honda Civic. You know, and uh, yeah, we're looking at this and we're looking at infinity. Oh my God, that would crush me, right? Because then it would almost come down to, well, I would always, I felt like I always had people ask me, well, what do you drive? And I'd be like, I got an infinity. You know, I'd be at the Honda store. What a mistake. What a mistake. This was so wrong of me. And, and it literally hindered my success. It held down my success. It actually made me perform worse 
because I had this internal belief that, uh, dude, this thing was way cooler. So how could I, I should have either one, been at the different dealership or I should have gotten rid of that thing, forget what I wanted there. Dude, I should have been locked in on what I was selling. You know, so you got to get locked in on what you're doing. You got to be willing to invest in your product. You got to be willing to spend money because look, here's something. If you do not invest money in your product, if you don't invest time and money in your product, do not expect other people to. Uh, so look, if you're, if you're on this channel right now and you don't sell cars, maybe you sell insurance uh, or maybe you work at the car dealership. Like this is another problem. You know, you, you go back and, uh, you know, you talk to the F&I guys, you know, you should be in your F&I department. Like if you get paid on F&I, the, the finance and insurance of the dealership of the vehicle, when somebody wants to, you know, add additional insurance to it, you know, the extended warranties, all those different things. Look, if you make any piece of money on that and you're leaving it up to a manager who doesn't invest in it themselves, dude, I, you know, I would handle that situation. I would pay for it for him. Because I would be like, dude, you got to spend money on this. Because look, if you don't invest in it, if the finance manager, if they don't buy the extended warranty, how are they going to be able to, like, with conviction, talk about this to the customer? Like, this is one of the biggest mistakes I think salespeople make is they don't even invest in their own product. Okay, now let me tell you something that I've personally seen in the industry I'm in now. So we train salespeople now, right? So I'm in the training industry. I see companies out there with people that I know. And it's like sad to even see this, but I see them not diving into their own training and doing their own deal. They are trainers. They've been in the industry. They've done this and that and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And guess what? Dude, they're not successful. They're not as successful as they could be. And in fact, I feel like they're selling a bad product because they don't even use it. They don't even believe it in enough to sell it, to even do it themselves. You know, if you're not willing to invest the time, the money, the energy into your product, into your service. Now, if you're on here, let's just say, um, you know, maybe you ride, maybe you ride Harleys. You know, I know we've got a great listener who uh, jumping into the Harley business. Spoke to him yesterday, or uh, spoke to her yes, uh, two nights ago. Listen, uh, if Jesse's out there, wanted to say what's up to you. Look, you're going into the Harley business. You need to get a Harley. Like you need to be into the deal. I think I think uh, Jesse's already into the Harleys, but. You know, you, you can't be out there, um, you know, selling Harleys and then, you know, well, you know, I actually, uh, well, you know, I don't really drive a Harley. I actually drive a, a Vespa, you know, because that's just the type of person I am. Not, you know, like, dude, what, in what world do you live in? Dude, if I sold Harleys, you know what I would do? I would cut every sleeve off every t-shirt I had. I would get tattoos and dude, I would get bought into the freaking deal, you know, because that is going to help me with my conviction into what I'm selling. And if not, look, you're going to have a hard time. I'm just telling you. So uh, let's roll into a couple of other of these. So, you know, that, that was lack of belief in the product. And what that really meant was, look, if you don't believe that it's good enough for you, how are you going to help anybody else and be sold that it's good enough for them? Uh, number, number five right here. You guys want to show this screen? Number five. Okay, number five right here. Actually, let me, let me zoom in a little bit for you. Incorrect estimation of effort incorrect estimation of effort. I mean, I can't even tell you, like this personally for me, like this has been a personal thing that I've had to run into over my career. Now there's been a book that was written called the 10X Rule, okay? It's sold hundreds of thousands of copies. I mean, I'm probably, we're probably even in the millions by now, okay? This is one of the best-selling books of all time, okay? This thing is at, at the top of every single charts. It's still there. It's been out for a long time. It's a movement. It's something that was built around the idea that people underestimate the amount of effort that it requires to be successful. And it lays out a game plan on how to actually get successful. But let's go back to the reasons closers fail. They underestimate how many times they got to ask for the sale. You know, look, let's do this. Okay. We, you should do this right now. You know, look, if you should be able to ask five, six, seven, eight times in the deal and know how to navigate around that. Like if you don't know how to ask a number of different times in the sales cycle, if you don't know how to trial close, if you don't know how to close, if you don't know how to handle objections, like, you know, the price is too high. The payments are too high. We're not putting a down payment down. You know, can you do it any better? Uh, we've got a better deal down the street. Like if these are things that you hear and then you don't know how to navigate that conversation, you're going to have a really hard time 
getting locked in because look, you underestimated the amount of effort and, and, and information you needed to have going into the deal. You know, uh, let me give you some other statistics. Okay, this is uh, current statistics in the industry. 48% of all salespeople, they never follow up one time. That's half. That's half, that's half of salespeople. Okay? And I tell you that because the good news is, is, dude, all you gotta do is figure out, well, what's it really take? What's it require? What is the amount of effort? <clears throat> so, 80% uh, of all transactions happen between five and 12 follow-ups. Okay? What type of follow-up? I had a question yesterday from some dealers that I was training. Okay? The guy said, and it was a great question because look, he was raising his hand saying, hey, you know what? I don't even know the answer to this. He said, is it better to call or is it better to email? You know, I said, dude, some people communicate different ways. Some people pick up my call every single time. Some people never pick up my call and they only email. Some people only text message. Some, I got a guy right now, uh, one of the guys here in the office that I talk to all the time, Mike Bonnet. Dude, I can't get the guy on the, this guy, uh, you know, text, email, nothing. Dude, but voice message? Did you voice message him? You get three voice messages right back. And then you get two more voice messages right back. The guy loves the voice message. This is what he loves. This is how he, he likes to communicate you know, to him. You know, obviously, he's working and hustling and getting his game on. But um, you know, I realized, hey, Mike likes to communicate via voice message. So I need to understand that maybe I need to do it that way to him. But that's not the same for everybody else. right? So the best communication, the best way to communicate with somebody is the way they like to be communicated to. And then I would also use all the other ones. I would also use text. I would also use email. right? So look, it takes five to 12 attempts. How many different ways can you get in there to stay in front of somebody? right? So you need to correctly estimate what type of effort it takes to get a deal done. How many times do I need to ask for the close? How long do I need to follow up? You know, I've been, I just closed a deal two months ago. Um, I had a guy tell me yesterday, he's like, man, I've been working a deal for a year. Good. It's good, man. I just closed a deal two months ago. I've been working for four freaking years. Four years. Four years. Okay. Do we got, you know how many employees we got that hadn't even been here for four years? Okay. You know how many people were on that deal? How many exec, there was executives in the company. For the other company that I closed, dude, they, they hadn't even worked there for four years. I'd been in the deal longer than they'd even worked at the company. You know, so big deal though. You know, I mean, massive deal. It's literally worth uh, probably like 10 or 20 standard deals, right? But I correctly estimated that, dude, four years, no problem. Probably makes sense. It's a freaking whale. You know, this it's a multi-million dollar deal, man. It's, you know what I mean? So I correctly estimated that way. I'm not getting frustrated like, man, these people don't want to buy. They don't want to do this, you know? Look, they don't even want to buy this product. You know, they're just tire kickers. Look, if you're, if you're saying that stuff, guys, look, it's you, okay? Because you cr un incorrectly estimated what it was going to take to get these types of deals. So uh, getting down to being reasonable is number six, okay? If you're being reasonable, you need to find out why why it would be like you should be unreasonable about doing this now. If you got somebody who's like, you know what, I'm gonna wait, you should figure out, look, why should I be unreasonable about this? You know, we're not giving them enough money for their trade. Do you think it's gonna get better? You think their situation's gonna get better? Like they're already upside down on their vehicle, their vehicle's not going up in value. You think that situation's gonna get better? You think you being reasonable, like, well, you know, maybe a couple, if you waited, you know, like, dude, you need to learn how to, you need to know why you should be unreasonable right here because you'll never, you'll never do any of this if you don't know why you should be unreasonable but with a customer. You know, listen, Mrs. Jones, I understand you're not getting enough money for your trade. I understand that it's not worth what you owe on the vehicle. I understand that you had a bad deal last time. Look, I totally get it. And I'm with you. But look, the situation's not getting better. I can make it better than it is now today. Okay, It would be better for you to do this today. And I want to make sure that you know that I'm 100% committed to getting this done with you and putting you into a better situation. That way you don't feel this way on, on anything further. right? So you got to know why you want to lean in on this thing. Because if not, you're going to back off on the deal. Okay, What about on a phone call? What about on a closing on an appointment? You know? Well, we're gonna wait. You know, we're really thinking about doing this. Uh, you know, here in a couple months, dude. Come down here today. Look, I'll make it worth your while.
Okay, let me come to you. Okay, you got to get unreasonable about this. You know, so you guys got to figure it out. Let's, let's take a caller. Nice. Hey. Hey, how's it going, sir? Good, how are you? Man, I'm doing amazing. What, uh, what type of business are you in? All right, so I'm interning. I'm kind of working for a startup. It's a digital, it's a, uh, digital subscription, so it's a service. It's a video active video interactive company, which just lets people do a ton of different things to videos you normally wouldn't be able to do, like add graded quizzes and add questions or add buttons to draw on the video and add comments. Nice. So it's great for like interactive video usage or a lot of teachers would definitely want to use it. Yeah, but we haven't found a ton of customers so far, even though we've been doing a couple different marketing techniques. So we're looking for different ways to do low budget almost like guerrilla marketing techniques that we could find out that would be hopefully effective in yeah. getting customers to subscribe to our website. Yeah, great, man. I, 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 would, do, uh, I would do some cold calling to, I, I would actually just look like, what problem do you solve? I would, I would start making a list of problems that you solve for somebody. Like this is where a lot of people have a hard time really um, you know, like articulating what they do or like really talking about what problems they solve. So who would... Uh, qualify for this, right? So you think about, okay, well, let's go with the teacher idea, right? So teachers, they teach people, okay? But the problem is right now is they've got COVID and they can't even get to them. And so this could, you know, solve that problem of connectivity to people who are stuck in their homes right now. Uh, what about people that facilitate information to their employees? You know, you think about some of these companies, um, you know, think about a company that's like, you know, a $10 million company a year, you know, they got 50 employees. Think about all the things that they have. You know, they got HR policies. They got new processes. They've got product, you know, programs. They got to get that information out. And the easiest and best way to do it would be to, you know, do it virtual, correct? Like what you guys have. Yeah. So one thing we have done is, for example, I used the teacher example because it's great for teaching students. You can have a whole classroom use this interactive video. You can have quizzes, you can have graded and attended can have a lot of different analytics recorded in the video. So yeah, we're okay. trying to reach out to a lot of teachers, which is what we've been doing for the last month or so, going mm -hmm. to staff directories and like getting emails, just reaching out to teachers. But yeah, I, I would also, I would also look for like somebody who's got some meat on the bone. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I, I don't know what type of deal you can do with a teacher. Um, I don't know if you're doing the deal with the school or with the teacher. Um, you know, but I, I would think about, you know, your business being a little bit more business to business. I would sell to people that, you know, they've got a, like a big chunk of, you know, an opportunity there. Like maybe somebody who's going to, you know, add more business in the future too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what, what's the hardest part of your job? Well, basically just coming up with a marketing technique that you can see a lot of good results with because so far, like what I that I've been doing this for a couple weeks and it's not yeah. super, uh, we haven't gotten a ton of results based on reaching out through cold emails and doing things like that. Yeah, so this is where like a lot of times in sales, you know, people uh, have a hard time like really talking about what their product solves, right? So, you know, you've got a digital program, that's the feature, right? But like what is the advantage of me having that? You know, is it that, I can deliver more content, you know, without being in front of an audience. And the benefit to that is I can still run my business and make money, you know. And so they're not going to spend money for the platform. Like they don't actually care about the platform. What they care about is they care about the, hey, I can still run my business and make money, right? So they're going to do that via the platform. They're going to do it through the platform, right? So this is where you really got to tie this in on your pitch, you got to have your feature, advantage, and benefit all tied in to a pitch, right? So um, it's like if I'm selling cars, you know, and I'm trying to sell a navigation system, you know, like, dude, I don't actually care about the navigation system. You know, I, I care about getting somewhere quicker and saving time, right? So if the salesperson ties that in the right way, then they're going to sell me on, oh, dude, I'd pay an extra 1200 bucks to get to where I'm going quicker and easier and, you know, save myself time. But I don't actually care about the navigation system. You, you, you see, see what I mean by that? You still in there? We got Brandon from North Carolina. Nice. Brandon from North Carolina. What's happening? Hey, how you doing, sir? Amazing. How you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thanks for asking. Um, so I own a pressure washing business here. 
in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, small community. And I'm actually going to be in Charlotte for a few months. And I was trying to figure out how I could build my clientele here. Um, I have no resistance to going to door to door, uh, you know, talking to different people about what's going on as far as my services. I've been five stars for ten years, mm-hmm. and I know that I could bring I could bring great services here. Uh, just trying to figure out a different marketing strategy. Yeah, I would just like tell people basically that uh, you know, listen, man, we're expanding into your marketplace. You know, we uh, you know, and, and I would come in. I would look for people that need some pressure washing uh, right now. Like I would look for urgency into doing this. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, who would actually benefit from this? You know, think about maybe like the real estate space, you know, people selling their properties right now and they need it to look better, but they can't afford a, you know, $30,000, you know, new paint job. Look, we can pressure wash it, make it look brand new. You know, it's like 10% of the price, you know, like that's one example, right? I'm looking for people uh, that I solve problems for, you know what I mean? So like who, who's somebody that, what's what's a, a type of clientele that comes to mind when you think about this? What problem do you solve? For? Uh, well, um, you know, I do more soft washing to minimize damages to the house of skin pressure washing, um, you know, killing algae and mold at molecular level. I was thinking about being able to use that as a platform with this whole COVID thing going on. Yeah, um, I love it. Just wasn't quite sure how I could market that. Yeah, no, this is great. So, like, this is where, but now you got to figure out, okay, well, where are these people come? Like, so this is where you got to ask the question. This is where you see Grant with the, the questions and the signs and the T-shirts that all say, who's got my money? Because it, that, that's a prospecting question. You know, hey, I've got a product or service. Who, has, who would trade their money for my product or service and actually want this and see more value in what I can offer them than the money that they have, you know? So uh, a good example would be to uh, sell to people. You know what I mean? If I were you, I would start with my power base. Who do you have friends, family, people that you've done business with that live in that area? Uh, I do. I'd call them today and I would tell them you're coming to town, you're expanding your operations. You know, you don't need to tell them that you're coming there for three weeks and you're basically packing up and coming over. Dude, hey, we're expanding into this area. Our business is blowing up. Who do you know in the area that would benefit from this? You know, and I would literally just reach out to people that I know first because number one, it doesn't cost you anything. Two, they already know, so they'll they know you, so they'll take the phone call from you, and then uh, and start that way and see if you can't start stirring something up. You know what I mean? And so you get one deal out of it. Now all of a sudden you got an opportunity to get some referrals in that neighborhood. Then you all of a sudden you, you know you know what I mean? This is how this is how a business would grow. This is how you create a pipeline of business. Okay. And then I, you know, was just thinking about just having some business cards, and because I don't mind knocking on people's doors, but more or less, just I mean, as I see people just handing out business cards, yeah, starting up conversation. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's good. You know, which ones? I, I would do a little bit of everything. You know what I mean? So this is where you know Grant in the 10x rule talked about omnipresence. You know. Am I everywhere? Like I would start, number one, promote where it's free. I would put all over your social media, hey, we're expanding into this market. You know, we're gonna, you know, hey, we've got a team in town today, wanna help you out. I would go door to door. I would call the people that I know there first. Like I would just do those things because it doesn't cost you any money. And, um, and, and it's an easy way to like spread the word. This is how businesses have grown for like since, you know, since time started, right? And, uh, and I would start there, and then once you get some money, then, you know, you start playing around with some other ideas on marketing. Okay, so, dude, great question, by the way. That's awesome, man, but I, I love the fact that these people are, are saying, hey, you know what, dude, I'm going in, I see an opportunity, I want to expand, like, just, your mind's already in the right place. You know, most people are sitting back, you know, they're not even thinking about expansion, they're like, you know... You know, man, it's going to be tough going into this new market. I don't know if I can do anything, but the fact that you're like already on the forefront, like, dude, hey, we can do something here. Okay, I can throw down here, man. This might be an opportunity for me to like really get big. I love that about you. Uh, so let's get into number seven. Now, this is, let's show this one again, guys, because I want you to see that I'm not making this one up. Okay, no financial plan in place. Now, this is not a budget. This is not a way to handle an objection. This is you not having a financial plan in 
place. So this is what I'm talking about right here. When I got this information from Grant, I mean, it was like light bulb went off, okay? It was, dude, you, he's like, you don't even have a financial plan for how many of these products you're gonna sell this month. What type of income target you need to hit. You don't, if you don't have a target, you can't hit it, you know? So I started to map this out. I remember this, when I first got started, I was like, okay, well, hey, I'd love to make this amount of money. Boom, this is my target. Then I, then I did the math on it. And I was like, well, how many people would I need to sell to hit this, maybe get a little bonus or a little spiff, and then actually hit my income target? I'm like, okay, well, I've got the X amount of numbers of people that would need it. Now I need to go find out, hey, who's got, you know, let's just say, the, like, I'm just gonna make the number up, right? Let's just say, I need to get 25 deals this month in order to hit my income target. Okay, well there's gotta be 25 people out there that want this. There's definitely 25 people that are gonna buy a product like this similar today, right? So I got a whole month to figure it out. Let's go to work. Then I gotta start asking myself the question that the same guy on this call started to ask, dude, who do I call? What do I do, right? So then I gotta start looking at who's got the money. If I don't have a financial plan in place, I'm not gonna be willing to lean in, make that extra call, make that extra push. Most of you guys are just showing up to your job every day, clocking in, clocking out, no financial plan in place. When I started to like mark down, hey, I'm gonna make 10 grand this month. Hey, I'm gonna make 25 grand this month. Hey, dude, you think I could rack up 50, 100? What's the limit? Dude, where could I go with this thing, okay? Until I started to put a target in place and, and start to, to put a plan, the key word is the plan, okay? I got the target, I got the financial plan. How many deals do I need to get for this? Once I started to do that, then I had purpose each day. I would come in, hey, I got 25 deals to close this, this month, okay? Let's start with number one, let's go to work. Who would be the first person to do this, okay? I'm gonna start with deals that may already be interested, maybe inquired, maybe requested, right? So I start working at that. Look, so this is why you guys have targets and quotas, but the great salespeople, the great salespeople of the world, they do not live up to the quota. Okay, a quota was made up by a manager uh, based off budgets and, and ways to keep the company expanding. Okay, that, it has nothing to do with you. Okay, you should be shooting for your potential every single month. That is what the greats do. Okay, but if you don't have a financial plan in place that says, hey, <clears throat> I'm gonna hit this target. This is what I came here to do. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show up. I'm gonna blow this deal up. And I got a guy, I got a guy that I work with. He was selling 50 cars a month in the business. The, the people, like his quota, like he was blasting his quota away every single month, you know? It's because he wasn't focused on the quota. He was gonna hit the quota, okay? The business needs quotas. That, I'm totally with you on that. But, but the guy shows up working his potential. He's like, hey, I need to make X amount of money right here because I've got a big game going on, man. I got a big game I'm playing right here. That's why he shows up with, with attitude, motivation, pumped up. He's willing to call somebody back who said they weren't interested. He's willing to call somebody back even though we did not have the right vehicle they wanted, right? So this is why you guys got to get a financial plan in place. This is why closers fail. Uh, number eight, handling objections that are only complaints. Now, this one is where it gets super interesting. Handling objections that are actually only complaints. What does that mean? What a difference between an objection and a complaint, okay? Let's take the most obvious one, the price is too high. Is that an objection or is that just a complaint? Price is too high. I say the price is too high everywhere I go. Okay, I just ordered uh, some Uber Eats this morning. I'm literally looking at the price. I'm like, it's freaking crazy. Can't believe they're getting that. And they get the extra tip. And they got the service charge. And the freaking tax. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Okay. Bye. Okay. I go to Starbucks, man. I'm like six bucks for, for a Starbucks coffee, dude. I'm, all, I'm almost like, dang, man. Like, you know, you guys are banking in here. I love it. Okay. You guys' prices are through the roof. All right. Yeah, let me get three of them. You know, dude, is it a complaint or is it an objection? You guys got to figure this out because if not, you're getting hung up and this is where, oh, the price is too high? Well, what if we could do a better deal, okay? Dude, you're not going to do well on this planet if that's the way you think, if that's the way you operate. If you handle complaints, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, listen, like if you're, if you're married and your spouse is like, dude, you snore too loud. Okay, well, dude, is she gonna divorce you? She's just complaining, you know? You're not gonna like shut it down and be like, well, I guess we're gonna, you know, 
you know, this one didn't work out. Let's call, let's call quits on this one, you know, you know, or dude, are you guys just going to be like, okay, well, like, what can we do to handle it? You know, let's just handle it. You know, so this is where salespeople get so caught up in the deal. This is where they'll call somebody up. You know what? Hey, we, we're, we're not doing anything for a couple months. Dude, that's total. That's a, just a, it's more of a, less of a complaint, not even an objection. Hey, would you mind if I showed you both ways? Would you mind if I showed you you doing it today and you doing it in six months? You know, let me show you what that would look like. Let, let's do a, a cost analysis. Let's show you the benefits of doing it now. That way, look, even if you did want to do it now, you'd at least know what benefits you'll get six months from now. You know, let, let me get 30 seconds. I can explain to you why it would make sense for you to even look at this right now and entertain it versus waiting six months. I could save you money, actually help you do a better, get into a better position, do a better deal, be in a better product, have more safety. Okay, we're in a time right now where safety matters. You know, so this is where, like, guys, do not get hung up on complaints. Uh, what are some other complaints that are out there? Complaints. Uh, you're not, you're not giving me enough money for my trade. Kelly Blue Book says my car is worth this. Why aren't you guys giving me this price? Dude, they were upside down on the vehicle. That's why they got upside down on this one. They were upside down on the last vehicle. Okay, somebody closed them on it. Okay, uh, they knew they were upside down and they still drove all the way over to your store. They knew they were upside down and they still called you up and said, well, what can you do? They were still upside down. They've been driving. Nobody knows that they're more upside down than that person that you're talking to. Okay, you just found out they've known for three years. Okay, they knew they were upside down going into the deal. Guess what else they're upside down on? Everything they do. This is how these people operate, man. They're upside down in their home. They over leveraged. You know, they're upside down on, on the boat that they got. Okay, they had no business getting a boat. Guess what? They got one anyways. Why? Because this is what, the way they roll, man. This is the way they roll. And you guys got hung up on just the complaint and you thought, you know what? This is stopping the deal and you didn't know how to actually just kind of break through that. This is where like being unwilling to, you know, work with emotion and actually just move through the deal. Hey, I understand we're not giving you enough money for your trade. Look, I know that you want to get out of this anyways. Are you willing to take, take the actual payment now to actually get out of this, get into a better situation? That way you don't have to think about it. Well, you know, we might, you know, well, look, let's do it. Let's just do it right now. Let's just get this done. That way you don't have to think about it. Either way, you're going to be upside down. This situation's not going to get better. Okay, you could try to sell this yourself, okay, but it's going to cost you more time and energy and effort to even try to sell this vehicle yourself and collect the extra $1,500 that we're missing. You know, we got to do all that. We got to put the money into it. We got to put the marketing into it. We can do it or you can do it. Okay, if I were you, I would do it too, but also I wouldn't want to waste my time like that when you probably make more money at your job. Is that true? Yeah, good. Then you have no business trying to sell cars. That's what we do. We sell cars. Okay, let us do that. It's going to cost you fifteen hundred dollars. You're going to miss that on your trade. We put it in your next deal. You can get into a new vehicle, a better opportunity, and you move on down the road. You never have to think about it ever again. Let us deal with the headache. Okay, I got three hundred headaches on the lot right now. Let us handle that. Okay, we want one like this. Okay, if you're not willing to run down that conversation, you're not going to get a deal. Uh, getting down to number nine, shortage of closing material. Okay, if you don't have closing material, if you don't have an arsenal of closes, uh, where's my book at? So we've got uh, the Closer Survival Guide. If you guys go to grantcardone.com forward slash free books, you can get the Closer Survival Guide free. You guys can get that book. You just got to pay for the shipping, get it sent to your house. Okay, you guys will get the free book. It's got 120 different closing strategies in there. When I, when I read this book, I had like sparks going off. It was crazy. I was like, dang, I've been looking for this. I get this problem every single week. You know, I just needed the words to say. I needed the information to use with the customer. I needed to know what to do and what to say. And once I started to read these strategies on, hey, customer says they got to talk to the spouse, here's what you could say. You could say, excellent. When you talk to your spouse, are they going to say yes or are they going to say no? If they say yes, let's do it. If they say no, is it going to be no to the money, no to the product, or no to the payments? You know, and I started to ask these questions. I started learning more about the customer and why they were actually objecting. I'm like, dang, man, like just a few of these. I'm like, and I didn't even say it that good. I'm like, I could actually probably practice and drill and rehearse and repeat this and do this over. And so I started to just hammer these in. Actually, one of my first ones, uh, I remember 
I was on, I, this is when I was, I was in the car dealership having a very tough time. I got the Closer Survival Guide book. I ended up coming in and I would read. I, I had this stuff written down on my phone and I would read cust how to handle customers who walk into the store and say they're just looking. And I remember that Grant Cardone laid out 12 different ways to handle that and I, was, I got one. I said, hey, a lot of people come to the store just to look. You looking for something bigger or something smaller than what you currently drive? And dude, I, I practiced and drilled and rehearsed that so well that, oh my God, it was unbelievable. I started just getting people into the sales process. I was moving them on down the line. It was amazing. Okay, so last one, we're gonna do this incorrect barrier. This is, you are handling the incorrect barrier. You're handling the wrong problem. Okay, so let's show the last, let's show this up again one more time. So if you guys don't have this, get the Closer Survival Guide book. We break this down. We went to all 10 of these. If you wanna go back into the show, screenshot these. We'll get them, uh, we've got them laid out for you. We've got the training inside Cardone On Demand. And uh, guys, as always, we're gonna be back here every single week to talk to you guys about how to make more sales, get more deals, fill up your pipeline, and uh, check it out, guys. If uh, you guys wanna go to the free book, get that free book, grantcardone.com forward slash free books, and uh, you guys can pick up either Sell It Be Sold, 10X Rule, Close Survival Guide, and uh, you know we'd love to help you out. So guys, we are gonna be back here next Friday we're going to be helping you guys out, so we can't, can't wait to see you. Thank you guys so much for dropping in. We'll see you back here next Friday on the 10X Automotive Weekly.